LibriVox.org. Round the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter 20 The Soundings of the Susquehanna. Well, Lieutenant, and our soundings? I think, sir, that the operation is nearing its completion, replied Lieutenant Bronsfield. But who would have thought of finding such a depth so near in shore, and only two hundred miles from the American coast? Certainly, Bronsfield, there is a great depression, said Captain Blomsbury. In this spot there is a submarine valley worn by Humboldt's current, which skirts the coast of America as far as the Straits of Magellan. These great depths, continued the lieutenant, are not favorable for laying telegraphic cables. A level bottom like that supporting the American cable between Valentia and Newfoundland is much better. I agree with you, Bronsfield. With your permission, lieutenant, where are we now? Sir, at this moment we have three thousand five hundred eight fathoms of line out, and the ball which draws the sounding lead has not yet touched the bottom for if so, it would have come up of itself. Brooks's apparatus is very ingenious, said Captain Blumsbury. It gives us very exact soundings. Touch! cried at this moment one of the men at the forewheel, who was superintending the operation. The captain and the lieutenant mounted the quarter-deck. What depth have we? asked the captain. Three thousand six hundred and twenty-seven fathoms replied the lieutenant, entering it in his notebook. "'Well, Bronsfield,' said the captain, "'I will take down the result. Now haul in the sounding line. It will be the work of some hours. In that time the engineer can light the furnaces, and we shall be ready to start as soon as you have finished. It is ten o'clock, and with your permission, lieutenant, I will turn in.' "'Do so, sir, do so,' replied the lieutenant obligingly. The captain of the Susquehanna, as brave a man as need be, and the humble servant of his officers, returned to his cabin, took a brandy-grog, which earned for the steward no end of praise, and turned in, not without having complimented his servant upon making his beds, and slept a peaceful sleep. It was then ten at night. The eleventh day of the month of December was drawing to a close in a magnificent night. The Susquehanna, a corvette of five hundred horsepower of the United States Navy, was occupied in taking soundings in the Pacific Ocean about two hundred miles off the American coast, following that long peninsula which stretches down the coast of Mexico. The wind had dropped by degrees. There was no disturbance in the air. The pennant hung motionless from the main topgallant mast truck. Captain Jonathan Blomsbury, Cousin German of Colonel Blomsbury, one of the most ardent supporters of the gun club, who had married an aunt of the captain and daughter of an honorable Kentucky merchant, Captain Blomsbury could not have wished for finer weather in which to bring to a close his delicate operations of sounding. His corvette had not even felt the great tempest, which, by sweeping away the groups of clouds on the rocky mountains, had allowed them to observe the course of the famous projectile. Everything went well and with all the fervor of a Presbyterian, he did not forget to thank heaven for it. The series of soundings taken by the Susquehanna had for its aim the finding of a favorable spot for the laying of a submarine cable to connect the Hawaiian Islands with the coast of America. It was a great undertaking, due to the instigation of a powerful company. Its managing director, the intelligent Cyrus Field, proposed even covering all the islands of Oceanica, with a vast electrical network, an immense enterprise, and one worthy of American genius. To the corvette Susquehanna had been confided the first operations of sounding. It was on the night of the 11th, 12th of December. She was in exactly 27 degrees 7 minutes north latitude, and 41 degrees 37 minutes west longitude, on the meridian of Washington. The moon, then in her last quarter, was beginning to rise above the horizon. After the departure of Captain Blomsbury, the lieutenant and some officers were standing together on the poop. 
On the appearance of the moon, their thoughts turned to that orb which the eyes of a whole hemisphere were contemplating. The best naval glasses could not have discovered the projectile wandering around its hemisphere, and yet all were pointed toward that brilliant disk which millions of eyes were looking at at the same moment. "'They've been gone ten days,' said Lieutenant Bronsfield at last. "'What has become of them?' "'They have arrived, Lieutenant,' exclaimed a young midshipman, "'and they are doing what all travelers do when they arrive in a new country, taking a walk.' "'Oh, I am sure of that if you tell me so, my young friend.' said Lieutenant Bronsfield, smiling. But, continued another officer, their arrival cannot be doubted. The projectile was to reach the moon when full on the 5th at midnight. We are now at the 11th of December, which makes six days, and in six times twenty-four hours, without darkness, one would have time to settle comfortably. I fancy I see my brave countrymen encamped at the bottom of some valley on the borders of a selenite stream, near a projectile half-buried by its fall amid volcanic rubbish, Captain Nicholl beginning his leveling operations, President Barbicane writing out his notes, and Michael Arden embalming the lunar solitudes with the perfume of his— "'Yes, yes, it must be so, it is so,' exclaimed the young midshipman, worked up to a pitch of enthusiasm by this ideal description of his superior officer. "'I should like to believe it,' replied the lieutenant, who was quite unmoved. Unfortunately, direct news from the lunar world is still wanting. "'Beg pardon, Lieutenant,' said the midshipman. "'But cannot President Barbicane write?' A burst of laughter greeted this answer. "'No letters,' continued the young man quickly. "'The Postal Administration has something to see to there.' "'Might it not be the telegraphic service that is at fault?' asked one of the officers ironically. "'Not necessarily.' "'replied the midshipman, not at all confused. "'But it is very easy to set up a graphic communication with the earth. "'And how? "'By means of the telescope at Long's Peak. "'You know, it brings the moon to within four miles of the Rocky Mountains, "'and that it shows objects on its surface of only nine feet in diameter. "'Very well. Let our industrious friends construct a giant alphabet. "'Let them write words three fathoms long and sentences three miles long.' and then they can send us news of themselves. The young midshipman, who had a certain amount of imagination, was loudly applauded. Lieutenant Bronsfield, allowing that the idea was possible, but observing that if by these means they could receive news from the lunar world, they could not send any from the terrestrial, unless the Selenites had instruments fit for taking distant observations at their disposal. Evidently, said one of the officers, but what has become of the travellers? What have they done? What have they seen? That, above all, must interest us. Besides, if the experiment has succeeded, which I do not doubt, they will try it again. The Columbiad is still stuck in the soil of Florida. It is now only a question of powder and shot, and every time the moon is at her zenith a cargo of visitors may be sent to her. It is clear, replied Lieutenant Bronsfield, that J. T. Maston will one day join his friends. "'If he will have me,' cried the midshipman, "'I am ready.' "'Oh, volunteers will not be wanting,' answered Bronsfield, "'and if it were allowed, half of the earth's inhabitants would emigrate to the moon.' This conversation between the officers of the Susquehanna was kept up until nearly one in the morning. We cannot say what blundering systems were broached, what inconsistent theories advanced by these bold spirits. Since Barbicane's attempt, nothing seemed impossible to the Americans. They had already designed an expedition, not only of savants, but of a whole colony toward the Selenite borders, and a complete army consisting of infantry, artillery, and cavalry to conquer the lunar world. At one in the morning, the hauling in of the sounding line was not yet completed, 1,670 fathoms were still out, which would entail some hours' work. According to the commander's orders, the fires had been lighted, and steam was being got up. The Susquehanna could have started that very instant. At that moment, it was seventeen minutes past one in the morning, Lieutenant Bronsfield was preparing to leave the watch and return to his cabin, when his attention was attracted by a distant hissing noise. 
his comrades and himself first thought that this hissing was caused by the letting off of steam. But, lifting their heads, they found that the noise was produced in the highest regions of the air. They had not time to question each other before the hissing became frightfully intense, and suddenly there appeared to their dazzled eyes an enormous meteor, ignited by the rapidity of its course and its friction through the atmospheric strata. This fiery mass grew larger to their eyes and fell with the noise of thunder upon the bowsprit, which it smashed close to the stem, and buried itself in the waves with a deafening roar. A few feet nearer and the Susquehanna would have foundered with all on board. At this instant Captain Blomsbury appeared, half-dressed and rushing onto the forecastle deck, whither all the officers had hurried, exclaimed, "'With your permission, gentlemen, what has happened?' and the midshipman, making himself, as it were, the echo of the body, cried, "'Commander, it is they come back again!' End of chapter 20 The Soundings of the Susquehanna Recording by Scott Robbins